inner monitoring visit regulatory. So, what specifically? What is the report that I'm asked that you were not sure about? Uh, for example, it says um, has the one five seven two been updated since the last visit? Yeah, fifteen seventy two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's fifteen seventy two. The most important form in research, by the way. Yeah, which I know by definition is a contract between the PI and the sponsor. No. The, FDA. The, the, the PI and the FDA. The <laughs> okay. The PI and the FDA. So, that's actually good. When does that need to be updated? Give me all the scenarios when the, 1570, when the site needs to update the 1572. There are two common ones. Mm -hmm. And then there are some uncommon ones. So, what are, what are some of the two common, two common reasons that would trigger a site to revise or update their 1572? Um, number one. Probably. And number two. Probably in a situation where uh, a sub-investigator has been added onto the... Correct. So in box six, right? Box six, any sub-investigators added. Okay, or removed. Or removed, yeah. Okay, so yeah, sub eyes added or removed. And what's the second most common reason? It happened to our site this year mm -hmm. for many studies. Hmm. I'm not sure. Think, think, think. It's a possible interview question, too. Mm -hmm. okay. See, this is also a job interview prep. But it doubles us both. Uh, perhaps if... Let me see. Contract. What goes in the contract? And one of the boxes, I don't know which box Maybe number. The PI, I think that's the first thing. You yeah. Fall. One of the box numbers has the site address. Okay. Uh, okay. So what happens if a site moves? And they need to contact the IRB and the FDA. They don't need to contact the FDA. This is how they contact the FDA. By filling out a Yes. So that's number two most percent. common update. Okay. okay. So when a site moves, um, you do have to get sponsor approval when the site moves. Sponsor has to approve it. Oh, okay. But you don't need FDA approval. You just need to inform them. Yeah, you just need to update the 1572. Okay. And you need to inform the IRB also. Oh, okay. well, you don't, you don't the necessarily. From the sponsor. Yeah, the sponsor has to give them the okay that they can move. Okay. Sponsor. So, if the sponsor doesn't want the site to move, then the site, the option is that they close out the site. Okay. Right? Um, and then the site will move anyways. You can't prevent a the site from moving. Moving. But, but it's you up to can, the sponsor to decide whether they want to carry yes. out that new site or terminate the. You can client. close out all activities at the site okay. if you wanted to. Usually they don't. Usually they say yes, and but it's a process, right? Because once you change this fifteen seventy two, yeah. Right, then you also have to send a new form to the IRB. Change of address form. They usually are call, called something else, something different, but they're they're all change of address. That's like the the topic for this form. Every IRB has different names for this form, but that's kind of what you. If you just call any IRB and say, "What I need a your change of address form," well, they'll exactly. give you one. Um, if it's a central IRB, okay. If it's local, mm -hmm. they have one also. Mm -hmm. Do you know the difference between central and local IRBs? Like uh, the main difference? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I know the main difference is is it the central one is usually I think that's the one used by uh, 
hospitals and uh, is it universities? Academics? No, 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 that's local. That's local. I, yeah. I don't want to. And then these central, central labs. Mm -hmm. Most private clinics mm -hmm. like ours. Um, and you should know, you should be familiar with the top five IRBs, most common. Quorum, mm -hmm. Western, Schulman. They're in interlinks where it says common yeah. IRB. There's a couple of less, and there's been a lot of mergers lately mm -hmm. with IRBs. Like I think Western and Copernicus merged. Quorum's still there. Schulman. There's Principal. Liberty. Is that one of the common ones? I've never heard of it. Yeah, that. Sterling. Yeah, Sterling. Sterling. Those are some, I don't know which one was this study that you monitored today. But Quorum. Quorum. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. So, uh, most sites use central IRBs, okay? Mm -hmm. And in the interviews, they're going to ask you if you have experience, like which IRBs have you worked with. Mm -hmm. So you should just name Quorum, because that's one that you did have work on today. Um, so that's the IRB change of address form, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you also, the site also has to notify every vendor that they're moving. Uh, including the clinical labs where they will yeah. send blood samples. Yep. Mm -hmm. So which vendors, good, so which vendors, uh, labs, right? Because yeah. the new lab kits need to be sent to the new address, not the old one. Yeah. What else? Oh, you can consider an IRB a vendor. What else? We'll what else does the site need? Obviously, the sponsorship. Yeah, so the site gets lab kits, fire B. Another important one. Patients have to take this. The IP, right? Yeah. So the IP vendor. Usually it's someone like Catalan or, um, actually Catalan's the only one that I know right now that actually does this. I think Covent supplies IP sometimes. It's been a while since I actually uh, ordered IP. Do you know how the site gets, well we can get to that later. So that's when the change of address, okay, that's kind of the process. Now, sub eyes, added or removed, that triggers a process as well. What else? Let's say you add a sub investigator, okay, to the 1572, and you being the site, okay, so the site adds a new sub eye. Mm -hmm. What else does that sub eye need to have? They also need to sign the 1572. No. They don't. So, in this particular... Uh, only the PI signs the 1572. The Did they... Was the PI changed at any time? Uh... No. Mm -hmm. okay. Not that I know. But the PI can change. Mm -hmm. That's actually another... But that kind of relates to the sub eyes editor. Oh, it's... Okay, my bad. What I... Uh, why I said the sub eyes need to sign also, they only sign, they also sign the uh, financial disclosure. That's right. Yeah. FDF. What else do they need to be added on? Uh, They're doing anything related to the study. Very important form. So financial disclosure form, correct. Let's get some of the easier ones out of the way. GCP, training. They need it, right? Mm -hmm. CV. Yep. Their license. Yes. What else? There's, there's one and two more very important things. Mm -hmm. These are basic. GCP, CV, license. It's basic. Financial disclosure is important, but not really mm -hmm. that important. But it needs to get done. But these two are utterly important there and there well I guess they need to be familiar with the uh, 
the IP and the protocol. Protocol. How do we know that they're familiar with it? How do we have proof? Yes, it is trading. Okay. Trading log, okay? You saw one in the reg binder, right? Yes. It's extremely important. If you're a CRA, which you want to be, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the most important, one of the most important things you need to check on. Trading log. Trading log. Just make sure that every person who's every on person. that project on the uh, trial Yes. Has a correct and how do we know who's on the trial? trial. Uh, by looking at the delegation log. That's right. So that's number six. Delegation log. Okay. Extremely important. So anytime you add a mm -hmm. sub by, they need all this, but these are the ones that you really have to check on. Trading, Trading log. log and delegation, delegation log. log. Okay. Same thing if someone is removed. It's easier. You know, you don't need to collect these things anymore. Yeah. You don't worry about the training log anymore, but you will make sure that they have an end date on the delegation log, uh -huh. okay. and that the PI signed off on it. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. And then you have the site would have to re redo the fifteen seventy two form. Okay. So these two things. I mean, as a CRA, there is nothing more important really than the training log. Sometimes you're doing the trainings. Okay. Do you know at which visit you're doing the training? You can do it at SIV. many. Yes, SIV. That's right. So at the SIV, if you do nothing else, let's say you only have an hour. Because yeah. sometimes the PI is only going to give you one hour of their time. Okay, maybe the coordinator will give you three hours with them, mm -hmm. but the PI only gives you one hour, or maybe even half an hour. What's the one thing you need to make sure you get? The training log. That's right. Okay? Because that's the purpose of you going there. So that's training log. So we went through um, new staff and added or removed and also changed of address. What about amendments? What's a protocol amendment? I don't even know how to spell it. <laughs> it's one thing. It is, right? Yep. Too much social media. So what happens? How many amendments? What What is a protocol amendment? Any changes? Any significant change to the protocol? Yeah. Yeah. And they're common in research. Right? You get about three or four amendments per protocol on average. Okay. Um, Usually the amendments are made to make the trial a little more efficient, to help with patient safety at times, or just feedback that they've received from sites that it probably would make sense to amend it. That goes back to efficiency. So three or four on average. So for a CRA, this is very important because it happens often. What do, what do you do, this is, I'm going to interview you now, what do you do when you go to a site for your interim monitoring visit and you know there's been a recent protocol amendment? What do you check for? There are, uh, let's start with three things. Protocol amendment, you're the monitor. Since your last visit, it's been amended, so now you're at the site. What do you look for? I suppose first I need to find out what those amendments are. Right, let's say you know. You okay. know what they are. Uh, I need to make sure that a copy of the amendment is in the regular rule binder. Okay, so maybe we'll have four. Okay, copy of the amendment. And how do you know the PI received it and read it? I uh, expect to see a signed copy by them there. Yes, protocol signature page. Okay. Every protocol has a signature page mm -hmm. with the new amendment number and the PI should sign it. Okay. 
but more practical, what what are some things? I'm trying to remember what the three things were. I know what two of them are. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> sure, like you I have to know. I can't remember, but... So, let's say I'm a coordinator. Yeah. And you're the CRA. Okay. And there's been an amendment. And you ask me, did you know there's an amendment? And I say, yeah. Okay. Okay. How do we know that I know what that amendment is? Well, I'll have to ask you to verify. But in research, if it's not written down, it didn't occur. Training log. Okay. Okay. Very important. And sites always forget. I shouldn't say always, but they regularly forget to update these things for amendments. Mm -hmm. How else do we know? Forget us. How would the FDA know anyone's been trained on the new amendment? If the PI says that he did, it's not enough. Well, I expect to see the training certifications. Training log. log. Because there's no certificate for an amendment. That's GCP. That's stuff that's not important. I mean, it's important, but for it's this study, yes, you only have one way to document that people are aware of the new protocol and that they've been trained on it. It's not enough just for the PI to say, yes, I trained my staff. It has to be documented. Of course, training. of course. And guess who's going to check that? Me, CRE. Yeah. <laughs> You're the only one. Supposedly, the sites are going to do it. Yeah, Supposedly, but do you believe that? No. <laughs> Why? That will be the first place. Why? Because sites are not really sites don't have an incentive to document these things. It's not an income generating activity. Sites generate income when they see patients. Okay, so all these things are defense. No one, the sites don't like to do that. They play offense. The CRAs are defense. Right. Training log. It's you're the only defense between the site and the FDA. If it's not for the CRAs, literally you have nobody looking at the data or the logs, and then the site is vulnerable to all kinds of findings by the FDA, which we don't want. The CRA's job is to take all the mistakes the site makes and shine it up like an apple. Or have the site shine it up like Apple because you can't really do I just don't too know much. What's required? But you can do training log. It's one of the only things the CRA can actually write on on a regulatory document for the site. Okay, at at, at every SIV, but then at IMVs you can either do it yourself if you have time, which is another issue. I mean, you may not have time. So then, what do you do if you don't have time to train? On an amendment, how do you how do you document in your report? What do you do? Let's say there's been an amendment, but you notice the training log hasn't been updated. What do you do? Do you just leave it alone? No, well, we have to notify the site. Right. Well, that'll be included in my report for that person. In your report, that's right. So it's that's an action item. Okay. So in your report on the last page, it's action items. Now, remember, the sites never see your reports. What do um, they see? Uh, there's something I sent to them afterwards. That's right. Yeah, I forgot what it was. <laughs> the report is for my superior. The report is for your lead CRA, your project, project, manager. project manager. Ultimately, the sponsor oh, reads every one of those. Mm-hmm. They're supposed to. They're going to ask you for revisions, clarifications. Then they say it's finalized. Now you may send the site a... Follow-up letter. Okay. F-U-L. Follow-up letter. That's for after your visit. Well, that's after my, uh, like you said, the um, CRE lead or the person yes. I'm supposed to have reviewed my report. and. The after your report's finalized. Okay. 
That's right. After your report's finalized, they're going to take out certain things that shouldn't be there, or they might ask you for clarification, and you might actually have to ask the site mm -hmm. for further clarification. That takes about a week. Then they say, okay, okay, Bo, it's approved. Send the site the follow-up letter. Or they won't even, maybe they won't even tell you that. You're supposed to just know that that's what you need to do. Oh, okay. okay they'll, they'll just say it's finalized. So typically, what's in the follow-up letter? You don't discuss any of these? Right? You discuss the um, screening, like the enrollment progress, mm -hmm. how many new consent forms were reviewed at that visit, any SAEs, and then all the action, uh, any deviations, protocol deviations, and then all the action items. So the only thing the site will see, like you can copy and paste all the action items. Mm -hmm. But all the other stuff, you have to put what it is, right? So that's a good question in the follow-up letter. You Now you'll have a template for this. Okay. So it's not like you're just going to so. create one. Okay. They okay. give you a template. Okay. But usually it has an enrollment update. Um... Informed consent update, which by the way, hint is the answer for number two. Okay. Um, and we'll get into that now. Um, SAEs, deviations, and action items. Okay. These are the most important things during your IMVs. Like these, this is it. That's why you get paid the big bucks. Hopefully, I think you you will be a CRA. Probably have to start as an in-house CRA first or something. But what I else? And also, what are questions I have for you for later? What's yeah. the difference between a, an in-house CRA? We can get into that. Um, yeah, we'll save that one. Okay. okay, so number two, what's the answer? Okay, so usually a protocol amendment triggers a new informed consent because usually they're changing some, one of the procedures or one of the assessments or maybe an order of an assessment so that the patients need to be informed. So this means that if, for example, during the study, there's a total of four amendments to the protocol. The ICF needs to be re-signed by the subjects four times. Is that what it means? Or does it depend Only on what the amendment is? No, because it could be... So, yes, in theory, yes. But in reality, mm -hmm. a lot of the patients would have completed the study before the new amendment, so they don't need to re-sign. Right? Mm. Why would there be an amendment on a study that hasn't completed? No, no, no. It's completed for that patient. The study's not over. Oh, okay. There's a length of study, mm -hmm. and there's an enrollment window. Okay. Okay. So let's say a study's eight weeks. And let's say an enrollment window is eight months. I can screen one of these patients, number one, let's call him, during week one. He'll finish in eight weeks. Okay, he'll finish in two months. So now I'm like here, two months. Now patient Wait, number eight. Enrollment is what? Eight weeks or eight months? Uh, the length of the study. The length of the study is eight weeks. Study duration mm -hmm. for patient. These are things people always confuse. The protocol you looked at, how long was it? When a patient screens to when they finish, mm -hmm. I, don't know. I don't know. Let's say let's say eight weeks, okay. Enrollment window. This is what how long sites have to enroll their patients. They have up to eight months to screen ten patients. Okay. Okay. So patient one is enrolled. Let's say in October. And it's eight weeks, so he finishes in December. Okay. In December, let's say in January an amendment comes up. Patient one is already finished. Doesn't so need to sign that amendment. That 
patient two might. All right. Patient three might. Patient they all might. Depends when they finish. So that's study duration versus enrollment window. Very important things to differentiate. It's not the same thing. So not every not every patient will see every amendment. Some may only see one. Some may see all. Just depends on the timing. Okay, so let's say let's take a, a calendar in January to eight months, August. Okay. So first of January to the thirty first of August, right? Yeah. Is the enrollment window. Yes. So what you're saying in other words is our subject may come on to the study on the 1st of March okay. and be done by the end of June, right? No, March, April, or the end of May. That's eight weeks. Okay. And then in June, there's an amendment. Yeah. So it wouldn't apply to them. No. And you could also then, in month six, whoops, which is yeah. June, you could have a completely new subject on the same study. Yeah. On a new amendment. Yeah. And maybe they've never seen amendment one, one or, two. or two. So they only get assigned for one anyway, which is the yeah. current one. It's just the amended one. Because sites, remember, sites are contracted to enroll a certain number of patients. Yeah. And they're given a certain time frame to do that. Okay. The, that has nothing to do with the length of the study for the patient. It has nothing to do with that. And it's competitive and another enrollment. thing I need to clarification is enrollment and screening. Uh, the screening happens before the enrollment. Um, it depends. There's a lot of acronym. Uh, there's a lot of uh, synonyms. Because when you say enrollment, would that mean that the subject automatically has gone through the inclusion exclusion criteria and they qualify for the? So study? it should mean that, but it could also mean just screening. You can also call this the screening window. But enrollment is synonymous with randomization. Yeah, but screening window, same thing, right? These two things have nothing to do with each other. Study duration and enrollment window, or screening window. Nothing. And some studies are competitive, so they might have like 30 sites across the country, but the sponsor only wants... 200 patients total. That's their end. Okay. They only want 200 patients. So once they reach 200, doesn't matter what the sites were contracted to enroll, it's closed. So they could close enrollment early, maybe. Uh, once if they sites are target, yeah. yeah, if they hit their target, well, which they, rarely happens. Yeah, if they hit the target though, right? Which, like you said, it, then it gets closed. And if along the way they realize that some people do not qualify because they didn't meet a inclusion criteria or they met exclusion mm -hmm, criteria, mm -hmm. what then happens? Oh, no, no, this is when they get them randomized. 200. Look, let's say it's 200 patients total for their N. This means randomized 200, not screened. Oh, okay. You could have screened 800 to get to that 200. Oh, okay. So the end that they care about is the randomized okay. patient. Now they can drop out after their next visit, but, but they still count. They, they count. Yeah, they still count. Not too many patients complete a study. It, there's a lot of dropouts. But they get randomized, so it counts towards the number. All right, but these students confuse these things all the time. Study duration and enrollment window, they're not the same thing. So what you said is correct in theory about all the amendments, but it's in reality when you map it out, it's not everyone's going to have the timing to get all four amendments, all four ICFs signed. Some will, but some won't. And then also it depends on when during the study those amendments That's are right. Placed, huh? That's right. You never know when they mm -hmm. could be amended, right? So usually they're spread out couple like three or four months apart yeah. but uh, yeah yeah so you can see how this can be confusing 
It's tough. It's tough to learn this. Well, when a study duration is, I think this one was about fifty. Was it? Now. I can't uh, remember that one. I think it was. I don't know. There was something about fifty-two weeks. Okay, so it might have been fifty-two weeks for the study duration. Duration. So from screening until end of study. Uh huh. So which means that uh, each subject would have been on there for. 52 weeks, right? Ideally, yeah. Okay. They well, could or, or have less, been, unless, you know, yes. I mean, that idea, that's they what they have the that's opportunity. Get, that's the expected. Yes. But of course, they can refuse, you know, decide to withdraw at any time. Or the doctor can Or the doctor withdraw. might decide to mm -hmm. withdraw them for whatever reason. And, uh, yeah. So, in that case, then they, and if in that sort of a situation there's been a couple of amendments, then it is very likely that uh, the ICF will be signed a couple of times. Yeah. yeah, correct. And as a CRA, you're looking for this. You're looking for the training locks each time there's an amendment. You're looking mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. informed mm -hmm. consent and making sure the subjects are re-signing, mm -hmm. re-consented, right? Uh, yeah, the third the one, thing? I don't know, I'm trying to think. Amendment, training log, informed consent, protocol signature page, if I remember, I'll bring it up, but I don't think there's anything else. Because when a, you, when an amendment, protocol amendment occurs, first thing you do, you make sure they've been trained. Second thing you do is you make sure all the subjects were consented if the ICF was also amended. Third thing, you write protocol signature page. And by the way, you'll collect copies of the, the training log and the protocol signature page. Mm -hmm. Not of the ICF, but there's an ICF log that you can... And the ICF log should have the amendments. I guess the for, the fourth thing, or the if there is a fourth thing, would be, is the site implementing the changes properly? Or are they still, like, did the site actually implement the changes? So if, if a blood draw needs to occur before ECG, and then after the amendment, it has to occur after, is the site doing that? Because, you know, if, if they sign a training log, this would mean they yeah, actually have been trained. Yeah. So that, that's, I guess that's the fourth thing, is you're actually checking if it's being implemented, all the changes. Which is the hard part for the CRA. Yeah, I mean, these things are easy. This one's hard. This is the SDR. You know SDR versus SDV? SDR. SDR versus SDV. Oh, review and verification. That's right, yep. Source data review versus source data verification. Source data verification is easy. Okay. doesn't take much to... That's not why CRAs make a lot of money. That's, that's, that's nothing. Like the, You can do that in high school. SDR is what's hard. Okay. Yes, because of all these things. Protocol changes. Now what was correct before is not correct anymore. Is the site doing that, right? Source data review. Also, inclusion exclusion criteria. Is the site randomizing everyone who should be randomized, or are they randomizing people that actually meet exclusion criteria or don't meet inclusion criteria? Those are that's SDR. You have to really know the protocol. For the SDV, you don't necessarily need to know the protocol. For SDR, that's where the money is made. Okay. Um, so amendments, regulatory. You know these are the essential things for the enroll um, follow-up letter. Uh, what else? What else do you have for questions? What do you send to the site before your monitoring visit? Interim monitoring visit? Yeah. Or a notification of what is going to take place? Yeah, confirmation letter. Okay. So you have a confirmation letter. CL, I guess. You have your actual visit, which you need to do a report and collect essential documents. And then you need to do your follow-up letter. Or F 
U L. Okay. What's the essential documents? We just talked about them, basically. Like the the essential things you need to collect um, based on the situation. So if there was an amendment, you know you need to collect a copy of the signature page. You need to collect a copy of the updated training log. You need to collect um, uh, the new ICF log, informed consent log, mm -hmm. to, to document the new version of the ICF was used for all the appropriate subjects. Um, another essential document is financial disclosure form for new staff, training log for new staff, delegation duties log for new staff. Right? These are all the things you need to collect depending on the situation. Why do you say collect? Um, am I going to leave the site with those documents? No, 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 no. Either they will give you a scanner, like a portable scanner, mm -hmm. or, um, I mean, every CRO or sponsor has their own SOPs. Mm -hmm. The one I work for, um, I have an app on my phone that I scan. I basically scan it with my phone and then convert it to a PDF file. I use Adobe Scan. I have one. Yeah, those are good. Now, some places won't allow that, but it depends on the SOPs. Of the Because what you're doing, you're taking pictures of documents with your phone. But it depends on the SOP. I mean, as long as... I don't think it's anything wrong as far as, like... Because you signed a CDA. Mm -hmm. So you have to so take... Yeah, and you have to take precautions to make sure that the data is not getting disseminated. But someone can hack your phone. So, I mean, you know, it's not like they're going to want a delegation log. But every CRO is different SOP. But that's how I do it. Okay, and then um, you had a question about the difference between in-house. So what's a trial master file? Uh, that's the, that's the copy of... Everything, and it's usually at the sponsor level. Yeah, so that's Intralinks. Intralinks mm -hmm. is a trial master file. Awesome. So as an in-house CRA, what you're doing is you are maintaining that trial master file. So a regulatory binder, essential docs, right? These are regulatory documents, basically. But there's more regulatory documents than that. There are SAEs. Okay. There are SUSARs, which are certain SAEs. That's the suspected, suspected unexpected, unexpected serious adverse reactions. This is when an SAE is suspected to be caused by the study drug. That's a SUSAR. Those are irregulatory also. Okay. Um, but the regulatory binder, you essentially have the essential documents, 1572, financial disclosure, delegation log, um, GCPs, training, SUSARs, communications with the IRB or sponsor, IRB approvals, of course the protocol, investigator brochure, there's a lot. I mean, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you'll see another reg binder tomorrow. These are regulatory documents, okay? It's not complete, we're missing some, but now a trial master file, this is for one site, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say this is for Dr. Dan, okay? Now there's another doctor, Dr. Chris has another site, he has the same things. Dr. Bo has the same things. Okay? The in-house CRA takes copies of all these things from the CRA. So you know how I said as a CRA you will take scans of all these things? Mm -hmm. Well, they go to the in-house CRA. Okay. And the in-house CRA maintains the trial master file which we use intralinks, but there's a few other vendors. And the TMF contains the complete regulatory binder electronically. They could be paper also, but now they're electronically, of every PI for that study. So all this stuff, 
for every site mm -hmm. goes in the TMF in different folders. Okay. Just like it So works. we have a multi center uh, study going on. Yeah, most so, studies are, yeah. So say at uh, 30 different sites. Yeah. Yeah. And each site would have its own regulatory binders. Of course. Say. And all of those regulatory binders are in the TMF. Yes. Okay. And maintained. Because remember, there's like four amendments, there's new staff coming and going all the time, even at one site, let alone 30. So you need someone to manage this TMF. And that's what That's the in-house CRA. Yeah. That's a great stepping stone to a CRA. I know many people that were in-house CRAs. Many of our students get hired as in-house CRAs. Mm -hmm. And then you can level up to a CRA. Yeah, because now you're learning the essential documents. You're, another thing that goes in the TMF that does not go in these regulatory binders are those monitoring reports. Okay. These go in the TMF. Because the sponsor can access the TMF, the FDA can access the TMF. So the monitoring reports go there, the follow-up letters go there, the confirmation letters go in there, and all the regulatory documents also. It's a lot of work to manage a TMF. Uh, there's a lot of in-house series. And some in-house series at different CROs do even more than that. Like they will assist CRAs with uh, certain tasks. Like if a site needs new lab kits, I mean, ideally the site needs to order them from the vendor, but sometimes the in-house CRA will help with that. Like more logistical type of things, but usually this is the vast majority of what you're doing. And I think that's a great entry level position. And even those are not entry level anymore. They require like one year or less, two years or less, which is exactly what you have. The or less is key. But you'll need to apply to 100 or 200 places to get a solid number of interviews. But being on the West Coast, you have a better chance because there's less people there. Less qualified clinical research professionals. It just seems like a lot to take in, if you know what I mean. I, uh, my concern is that I wouldn't... My concern right now yeah. is that I'm not certain what's expected of me and what I need to do. For example, what you told me to do earlier, I'm not sure that I've done the right thing. Or, for I really only totally went through two of those subject binders. Yeah. I spent more time going through the regulatory binder, Good. and there were times where I found that when I started doing this. So, I'm the sort of person I learned from watching other people. So, I I suppose if you were doing it, you would have done it differently. And also, I need to be able to work Probably. where I can manage my time efficiently to get the best results. So, I'm not sure, you know, if I should have started with the binders first, the subject binders first, if I should have started with the investigation <laughs> brochure, or you know what I mean. Everyone so has a different I order. I, I always start in the order of the report. But if I know... Well, how can you you start by filling this out? Is that what you mean? Yeah. How do you start out with this when you haven't gone through the... I go through it. Like, I'll go through it while I'm doing that, and I'll start with number one. Yeah, but I like to finish my report before I leave the site. Yeah, I we, I, yeah, I I would like to do that really because it's best. To, I think it's better to do it that way because you're there, you're checking you're there, right there, there. You don't want to take it home with you. Day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But then I feel like you have to go through the binders. Well, what you reviewed today was a lot. I told you that for mm -hmm. one bit, that wouldn't be that would require like three monitoring visits. What? <laughs> That was just one. I actually to wanted to overwhelm you. You did. <laughs> Good, because that's how it is going to be sometimes. But then I told you just fast forward to get through the report. But of course, during a real monitoring visit, 
Now, if it's traditional monitoring, that's 100% source data verification. All right, you know what that means? 100, it's what it sounds like. 100% SDV, okay? Traditional monitoring. This is like the old-fashioned monitoring, but a lot of it's still a lot of it's still being used. And then there's one that got a lot of attention: risk-based risk monitoring. So traditional is a hundred percent SPV. So the studies I'm on as a CRA are still using traditional monitoring. So like if I had all those books to I. Uh, that would be, I would need at least two monitoring visits, maybe three, to go through all of that. So that was a lot, but I'm just showing you the volume. Tomorrow's is not that much. It's Tomorrow's is like a bunch of screen failures and I think one randomization. That will be easier. So what you were wanting to do was 100% SDV. Yeah. What is most likely to occur, especially by the time you're a CRA, Every site is monitored differently based on their risk profile. Okay, so your lead CRA, your project manager, they're going to assign a risk profile for each site. Okay. So they know that this site enrolls a lot of patients, but they get a lot of deviations. So you got to do closer to a hundred percent SDV there, but then site number two, you might only need twenty percent. SDV, and they'll tell you exactly what to focus on, uh, okay. which assessments, and which visits, okay? And this can change. These numbers can change during the study. That's part of the monitoring plan, which is, as a CRA, you're not developing monitoring plans. At least most CRAs don't do that. And as an in-house CRA, you're not developing those either. Mm -hmm. But that's another thing that goes in the trial master file. Mm -hmm. What's the monitoring plan for this site? Well, we're going to do risk-based monitoring with 80% SDV. And it goes in more detail. It says what is it to focus on, what assessments, what kind of things to focus on. 20% SDV. Now, regulatory, you're always going to want to collect updates. That's always 100%. But the source data verification and the SDR could be 100 or very low. So that don't be overwhelmed. Essentially, what you started doing with that study is 100% SDV. And basically, what I told you to do was switch to risk-based. Mm -hmm. It is a lot of stuff. It's a lot to learn. It takes like a good decade to learn a lot. A lot of these concepts. So that's pretty much it. I mean, that's your report for today. Do you feel more confident? Only a little bit. Or less. less. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm getting a, l a little more confident, but not as confident as I would like. On that. It'll be easier tomorrow. Tomorrow's the last day. I hope it will be. Yeah, it will be. Um, it's meant to be overwhelming. But, and it's also meant to kind of steer you in a, to, at least you'll know which direction as far as jobs to apply for. Okay, so apart from, you know, you mentioned that uh, one is a, well, unlikely to start off as a CRA. Right. What are the other possible ways? I know you Trial master file specialist. Yeah, you mentioned a CRC. In house CRA. That's where he was, right? Kobe? The guy who was here? Yeah. Yeah. A, he's a coordinator. Well, he's a research assistant. What's the difference? He's not a full coordinator, so he's just assisting Monica with her work. So do you have a coordinator here? Yeah, Monica's site director and coordinator. By January, Kobe will be a coordinator. Oh, so is a coordinator a higher level than a research assistant? Yeah. Coordinator is managing everything at the study, at, at the site. So when, at the moment, if you have patients, they get sent by Monica? Yeah, but he sees them to you. 
Yeah. So the RA, it's the best way to start. Research assistant, coordinator, if you don't mind, then the in-house CRA. Like, that's the places with no patient interactions, just mm -hmm. paperwork. The site level is both patient interaction and paperwork. In my opinion, study coordinating is more difficult than monitoring. The only difference is, as a CRA, you're traveling all the time. So it adds more stress because you're never in one place. Well, as a coordinator, I think you work more than a CRA. Well, you're in one place. Yeah. But I think they work more. Because remember, they have to deal with the CRAs. They, they have, have to, to deal, deal with, with the, the PI patients. and the patients. Yeah, the monitors only them. have to deal with the PIs and the, the uh, their the lead stuff. Yeah. yeah. I don't really want to have to deal with the patients. Yeah, so in your case, you've, like something with regulatory, you can be like a clinical trial administrator too, which is similar to in-house CRA. What does that entail? They kind of do in-house CRA stuff, but mixed with like some administrative stuff, like uh, like I mentioned earlier about helping sites with logistics, um, following up with sites for documents. Because you you'll be, I mean, you would be pretty optimistic if you think that all those documents that I said the in-house CRAs uploads to the TMF okay. actually get done in a timely manner. So you need somebody to follow up with the sites, and it's not always the CRA, because they're busy. I mean, they have other sites to, to visit. So clinical trial administrator is good. You can work at a site and not have patient interaction. It just has to be a big site, because you can do just regulatory at a site. Is that like TMF too? Or? It's just regulatory for that site. So you're ah, just maintaining, okay. you're starting just for up. for that site. Yeah, okay. just for that okay. site. Okay. Like at a hospital, you can do that. University. Okay. Around you, um, UNLV, they have a medical school? No, right? Yeah, they do. They do? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they do research. They do. The doctor on uh, this study. Oh. He, he studied medicine. Yeah, he did. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. So, at a university or a hospital where they do research, mm -hmm. you can work at the site level without interacting with patients. At a small clinic like this, you can't. At a bigger clinic, you can because they streamline. So they say, Kobe, you just do regulatory. Monica, you just see patients. Bo, you just do, you just do data entry. That's where Shanae got started. Shanae got started as data entry. Ah, I think I would like something like that. I think data I think, entry would yeah, be good. I think I'll do pretty well with that. I think you would too. I th and I think that is a great way to get your feet wet into getting into some CROs. Mm -hmm. But if I were you, I would go with like a university or a hospital in your area. Because you seem more inclined for that kind of work, which is, it's good. There's opportunities. They just want some experience, not a lot. And now you know all these things we just went over.